food is not your friend. Food is not your emotions. Food is not, food is nutrition. That's it. And unfortunately, yes, that's it. Not if you repeat that all the time, then you stop that, uh, that, that sensation. You have to have food. Like when we are sad, when we are happy with, we celebrate always with food. But it's, if we understand to separate that, no, I'm eating because I need to eat. That's it. Not because I'm feeling something. It really kind of like a stop. And that's kind of like a cognitive behavioral therapy. Separate one thing to the other. You have definitely two brains. You are definitely two people in your life. The good one and the bad one. Separate that. And the good one has to win. ADHD Rewired episode 327. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Luz Germeo. I didn't actually find out if I was about your last pronounce the last name of your pronunciation. I realized that as I was about to say it, <laughs> Luz Germ Jeremillo Jeremillo. Yes, that's right, so, Jeremillo. Jeremillo. Okay, I was like, so is it a, a LA or is it a? Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, we're gonna keep rolling. Um, so Luz Jeremillo. Um, she's a uh, MSW, so she's a master's in social work. She's a. So you have a lot of certifications: certified life coach, master in uh, NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming, a certified brain health coach, a certified knowledge broker. That's a new one for me. Uh, yeah. She's also studied neuroplasticity, eating disorder, stress management, mindfulness, um, metabolic health, and uh, fitness coach. And uh, you're a best selling author and motivational speaker. Um, Luz has ADHD, dyslexia, and learning difficulties. Uh, she uh, suffered from an eating disorder for most of her life. After studies and research, um, Luz was able to heal and lost almost 50 pounds or lost over 50 pounds, improving her focus, productivity, uh, able to read books that she can never when she could never start one before. Uh, so Luz works to help others achieve the desired healthy lifestyle and well-being. That was a nice, nicely written intro. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, let's start kind of with your ADHD story. Um, yes. When did you learn that you had ADHD? I was actually five years ago. I knew that I always had some problem, especially at school. It was really, really difficult for me. And knowing that I have learning difficulties, dyslexia, so writing, memorizing, it was really struggling for my entire life. Mm -hmm. And um, just recently, just discovering how to heal my eating disorder is how I find that out that I have ADHD. So tell me how that works. So you you identify that you had an eating disorder, um, and how was how did that path um, lead you to learning that you had ADHD? Just because I wanted to focus more into the brain and the fact that I couldn't remember well or when I was trying to do certain things, I realized that food, it was a big influencer into my mood, my well-being in general. Uh, what I did is uh, studying the brain is when they give you different... Uh, areas that one of that was especially for people with ADHD. And I was a little surprised to know that the obesity, like the research shows that about 40% in kids with obesity, they have ADHD and 70% of obese people also had ADHD. So that was like a wow moment for me. It's like, okay, so maybe this is related. So I started digging deeply and learn and searching and 
and it was absolutely me. It was totally like, couldn't be more. I don't know if I was a happy person or the sadness person, but, but it's like, okay, this is me. I do definitely have ACAD. So, um, uh, can you share a little bit about what your, um, like what your the, the eating disorder you had sort of looked like? Yes. Uh, eating disorder for me was a total of uh, 36 years of constantly binge eating. Uh, I was uh, from the morning until the nine. Uh, when I wasn't at school, I realized that food was my comfort, especially for homeworks. Like I couldn't really pass an exam without having some food next to me or everything, every time I was, I couldn't leave in maybe 30 minutes without food. I always have to open the refrigerator and get and grab some snacks. Even when like, you're not hungry, it was... Never mm. I felt the what it feels to be full. I never had that sensation of I'm full. Mm. No. Even when I was sick, when my stomach was hurting, I, I had the necessity to eat. You know, it was interesting. So we, uh, I, I don't know if you uh, know who, uh, Dr. Roberto Olivaria, uh, is. He, he, he does, uh, he talks, um, one of his specialties is, uh, um, eating disorders, uh, with ADHD. And, uh, just, we just had him in our alumni community for our webinar and he was talking about, um, the, the, um, you know, our, our sensory system. We have this, the interoceptive, uh, sense, our ability to feel like basically our organs, um, our yeah. ability to, to feel, that sensation of, uh, of being full. Um, and, um, the hormone, the leptin. Well, and part, part of, of that is like there are, and it also includes our ability to know when we are even hungry. Yes. Um, so, um, uh, he was talking about for people with ADHD, that is often something that uh, can, uh, there's correlation between the impairment of our interoceptive sort of system, our ability mm-hmm. to sort of sense what, what's going on inside of our body um, with, with ADHD, which then makes a ton of sense why 100%. people would overeat or totally. wait or not eat until, and I was sharing with him that like, sometimes my uh, hunger cue is the headache that I'm getting because I haven't eaten. Right. And which is a really bad hunger cue. Um, <laughs> so, um, so for years and years, you were doing a lot of emotional eating. Um, at what point did you, uh, like what was happening that made you go, I need to help with this. You know, the funny is I was, when I was trying learning, trying to read books, which it was really hard for me, while I was reading, I couldn't concentrate about the topic of the book, but it was about eating disorders and it was about being cheating. And it was how the brain works and that we do have to separate the two types of brains, the frontal and the amygdala, which is the most emotional part of the brain. So while I was reading books about emotional eating, I discovered I was eating ice cream with a brownie at the same time. So I get to the point that I was crying, literally devastated, uh, and it was uh, the most horrible feeling. And and it got to the point that I was I was more obsessive between food and my body. I hated it all my life. And even though people saw me and the pictures, I was trying to look for pictures when I was really heavier. My my perception of myself was a five hundred pounds person even though it couldn't be only five to 60 pounds weight either. But the, the fact that you can see yourself differently, mm-hmm. it is really bad for yourself, the guiltness and the shame. And while I was learning that, I was literally crying and I went to the deepest and the worst emotion of the, com- I, I was at home grabbing food all day long and mm. it was getting to the point that it was too bad for me. So you were like learning about this. You were like in your mind, you're like, I don't want to be doing this. And while doing it, like while thinking that you're continuing to, to eat. Like, well, your was, focus yeah. expand. And let's be honest, because it happened first with meat food, where the more I wanted to give away the food, the more I wanted to quit the food, the more I wanted to be on a diet, the more obsessive I became uh-huh. with the food. And when I learn about how important, when I learn about ADHD, how important is your brain and to keep it healthy, it was, became more like obsession. If I don't take care of my brain, I'm going to get to the point that I'm not going to be able to remember. I'm not going to be able to function. And it was really the struggle is part for me. And the fact that I worked with Alzheimer's for 25 years that was like, oh my God, I really never want to go to that point in my entire life. So that kind of like helped me to 
put a, a little bit of stop into that, but the more that you focus, as I say, it really, really expand. So when you focus in with ACHD, we are bad, we don't sleep well, we have emo- dis- emotional dysregulation, the more we focus into that, the more we're going to feel it. So I try to switch that. And in neurolinguistic programming, is, is a technique that is called a switch. And I try to practice a lot that when I have a negative thought, when I have a, a, an emotional thinking about food, what I do is I switch it for something more pleasure because that's how exactly what the brain keeps doing, looking for pleasure and then avoiding the pain. Mm-hmm. So since I was aware of that, I was more conscious of my behavior, which is really, we keep saying we have impulsivity. We don't have control of ours. You know, it's really true if we want to believe into that. But I started to change that thought and it's, I do have a control, even though it's super hard for me. And, and even though I all for 36 years, I was I, saying I have a binge eating disorders. I have an eating disorders. I cannot stop sugar. I try to change my words. So it was, about, it was about changing your, your the, just the, because I know when we, we change the words that we use, it does change how we feel about things and it changes how we respond uh, behaviorally to things. Um, and so, and it's interesting too, because I was um, I, having some conversations uh, uh, with a friend recently about this. Um, uh, it was, uh, I was actually talking to uh, Jessica McKay from, from How to ADHD because she's putting together a, um, a video on, she wants to put some videos on, on cognitive behavior real therapy. And um, so she was asking, like, well, what do, I, what do I think is like the essential pieces that really need to go in there? Because, you know, if uh, for those who've seen Jessica's, uh, oops. yes, for those who've seen Jessica's work, she, I mean, she's able to take, I mean, she puts like 80 hours into an episode and takes these huge concepts and distills them into like five minutes, which is such a hard thing to do. So she's really trying to identify what are the essentials. And you know, one of the things I, I said to her is that I think that one of the things that people uh, sometimes don't grasp all the time with, with the idea of cognitive restructuring and, and changing your, the, your thoughts around things is that the change in feelings does not come right away. Like no. in fact, like when you start having like changing your thought patterns, you're going to notice your internal critic, or as I like to call your ADBD shitty committee, like it starts screaming even louder and calling you a fraud because like he doesn't recognize these thoughts. Right. And that's normal. And but the more we change our, you know, the more we think something, the more we think something. Right. Yes. So when we begin to do to have a new thought pattern, it's going to feel internally unfamiliar our brain's going to send us signals that go what's this thought this is not familiar like where is this coming from so it's going to feel well this isn't working this is stupid right it's like no but stick with keep reframing the thought keep reframing the thought and you know and sometimes it can take a couple of years and i think it's important for people to know yes. that it does take that you know because learning happens through spaced repetition yes. right so I, think it's I want really, to give you an example. Yeah, I, I was one of the things that I was learning is to write, uh, like, let's say positive affirmation that people don't believe in positive affirmation, but neutral affirmation. So what I was doing is writing and I have clearly from 10 years ago or five years ago when I started with this, what I did is I write it down. I eat healthy. I love, I eat, I love to eat healthy. I love to exercise. I love to, uh, I don't like sugar or things like that. The word no, it doesn't work in your brain. So I wasn't right. avoiding it's, that word. Our brain doesn't know the difference because it, 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 it knows subjects. It doesn't know, um, it's like, don't eat chocolate. Your brain is just thinking about chocolate. It's not thinking about what not to do with it. It's just thinking about chocolate. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it's true. So I have, I have the papers with me, with the dates. And it was amazing to see that now I, I just say, okay, if it works, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to try. I don't care if you tell me in my brain is telling me that's crappy. That doesn't work. Yeah. Keep sure dreaming about it. But I have a picture of my body and I have a picture of everything writing it down. And now I read it and I have both in my head, like I couldn't believe the emotion that I feel right now to realize that it really works. Mm. And tell me the difference. Why for 36 years, I try to do absolutely everything. I was ready to have a surgery because I hated my body so much that I had it secretly. I never told my family except my sister, but she's a doctor. She literally almost 
kill me because you said, Luz, you have two kids. And I've been a doctor and I know, and I'm from Colombia. There are so many surgeries there that are cheaper compared with the United States. I was there. I was ready. It was supposed to be secret. Nobody need to know because it's something that you put something in your belly and nobody understand until for a month is when you see the difference. I told her, let me do it. This is for my life. This is only my dream. I want to have a flat belly. That's all I care. She's like, I'm not going to let you. And I said, well, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm, I need to have this surgery done in order for me to be happy. And I thought that was my solution. Mm. When she says no, and when I realize I have another why, which is my family, I said, you know, okay, let me find another way, but I'm going to find that way no matter what. And I'm, until I'm not finding it, I'm not going to stop. And I kind of like learn and repeating the same thing over and over. I eat healthy and Trust me, I hated it before. I never had a salad when I was a kid. I never had healthy food in my entire life. I only had sweets, mm. literally. Like I have maybe one little bit of a spoon of good regular food and everything else was sweets. So that was my passion. And when I started to change my thoughts and repeated it and writing it down every single day, even though it was, for me, it was worthless. Five years later, I saw the results. And it was like, wow, an aha moment. When you think back now about like the, the uh, length you were willing to go through for the, you know, this belief that a flat stomach would make you happy. Like, what do you think about that now? No, I, I now I see my body and it's, I love it, <laughs> which I never in my entire life thought that I was going to be able to love my body because the first thing they say, look at the mirror. And, and I totally understand every woman or every person who look at the mirror and I say, how do I'm going to say that I love it if I hate it? But um, I think I work so hard and so deeply. And I think now that I read the most about ADHD, uh, that's what exactly we achieve. We are big achievers. And when we have something in our mind, we are over-focused into that. And I was over-focused into food, but now I was over-focusing to be healthier. Uh, I passed my part into my body, to my brain, which I hated it all my life. And now is what I love the most. Mm. So it's really, it, I totally understand anybody who says, I love my body. It's impossible to love something that you have hated all your life. Mm. <laughs> it really requires a lot of work. So let's do this. I want to uh, um, talk about some strategies, uh, specifically when, when, you know, ADHD is in the picture and we have sort of impulsive tendencies. Yes. Um, so I want to sort of uh, dive into some strategies. But before we do yes. that, I would like to take a quick break um, and we will be right back. We just finished one of our coaching groups and we'll begin another in a few weeks. There is a beginning to all of it. It is satisfying to watch people grow and discover that they can do hard things and restart a journey. And we also have at the beginning of a new group that will discover that they can plan and be more satisfied in their life and also discover things about themselves they didn't realize. Whether you are a new podcast listener or have been here for a long time, welcome to all of you. I'm glad that you're here. We are a community of people with ADHD that join together to listen to stories on the podcast or join the community in our coaching groups. For those of you who are thinking about joining our coaching and accountability groups, our 21st season of coaching groups for this summer are now full. We have a wait list, so go check out the website to see how many people have waitlisted for each section. If you are interested in getting on the wait list, scroll down to the coaching page and send a message to us and we'll get in touch with you shortly and we'll send you the details. The website to do that is coachingrewired.com. If you have been thinking about joining these coaching groups, now is the time to go to coachingrewired.com and click the black button to join our interest list for the fall coaching groups. Our fall sessions run October 12th through December 18th. Don't wait, we fill up every season. Get on the list so you can be the first to receive an invitation to our registration event for our fall coaching groups. Registration is by invitation only. Go to coachingrewired.com and click on the black button. That's coachingrewired.com. Have you heard about the Succeed with ADHD Telesummit? If not, it's not that weird, I guess, because if this is your only source for information for ADHD, I meant to put an ad in this podcast last week and I totally forgot. So it started yesterday, but don't worry. It's 
free to sign up. There are a gazillion ADHD experts, like 25 of us, who are sharing tips and strategies all week long. It just started uh, on June 22nd, and it goes through June 26th, and you will get free gifts. I will be speaking about accountability. So don't wait. It is free to register, and if you miss any of the sessions, you can watch them free for up to 24 hours. Uh, Check the website. All the information will be there, and that website is adhdrewire.com slash summit 2020 that's s-u-m-m-i-t 2020 so go register while it's still free you will also have the option of purchasing the adhd success kit a guide to each of the talks to help you follow along and also includes a bonus gift my interview and a bonus gift are out there as well so go check it out at adhdrewire.com slash Summit 2020. That way, they'll know that I sent you. All right, we are back with Luz Jaramillo. Did I do better this time? I'm a, I'm yes. All right. Much better. All right. Um, all right. So let's talk about some of the common sort of issues that, that come up for people with ADHD uh, around food. Um, you know, I know for me, um, and I've shared this on a podcast before that, you know, on a fairly regular basis, I will uh, get into these debates with the box of graham crackers and the graham cracker seems to always win because it's uh, it's nighttime and my meds have worn off and I'll like be the hunger sort of kicks in because now I'm actually realizing how hungry I am because I hadn't really eaten enough during the day. Um, and I have, there's been so many times where I'm just like, I don't want, like, I don't need any more. I don't even want any more. And there's just like compulsion. It's like, just, you know, just one more, like one more grime cracker or one more of my, my, um, new sort of snack obsession is, um, uh, uh, these granola bites that are made by a company called Bare Naked. They're like the, these mm. peanut butter honey. They are, they are ridiculously good. Like it's like, to me, it's the perfect snack food. Like I, I don't know how they could, it's like perfection in the mouth. And, you know, <laughs> and I think this package is supposed to have like five servings. Um, it, a package maybe last me two days. Um, <laughs> I know it's, you know, I could be eating a lot worse things. Um, so it's like, I know that, that for me, especially like sweets and especially like baked goods, I mean, I don't have a chance against baked goods. Like it's just, it's not a fair fight. Um, so I don't bring those things in the house. Right. So a big yes. part of how I deal with, um, my tendency to, you know, as, as a sort of a, a snacker, um, it, and someone who will snack more than they even want to, um, is I limit the kinds of snacks that I even have available to me. Cause it's, you know, it's like, it's really hard to eat a fifth donut if you don't have any around you. Right. Yes. Um, so that's, that's one of the strategies that, that I use is just sort of like, you know, and this is, kind of goes to ADHD strategies in general, set up your environment to be conducive for what you need. Yes, I normally do that. And uh, I, I have a few clients and a lot of moms who are telling me like, but I have to have a snack for the kids. Yeah, but if you have the snacks for the kids, like I couldn't have, uh, uh, for example, for uh, Halloween, I was the one eating the candy. Let's be honest. <laughs> I was telling my kids, you cannot have it, but it was for me to keep it in the office and eat it at all. <laughs> so what I did is at the end, I ended up giving it to a senior centers, all of the candy, which wasn't bad for them as well. But, <laughs> but listen, give it to someone else. If I have it with me, I'll eat it. So first of all, be aware. If you cannot receive even a popcorn, you know that you're going to eat it all. Don't keep it. Right. So that's definitely one. The second that I never know how important it was, it was you really have to have nutrition food no matter what, at least for the three main meals. So I was, I, nobody, people don't care about breakfast and truly all the, the schedule is not important. And I know what you're saying. I can't see your face. You don't have to have breakfast. Definitely not. But the first meal, it could be at 12, it can be at one, it can be at any time if you're fasting or if you're, if you're, um, doing any type of diet, the first meal, whatever time it is, is what it counts because it goes to the blow, the sugar into your body. So definitely have protein, all of the three more components, protein, carbs, and good, good, good fats. The good fat give you energy and the good fat make you fuller. And I didn't know how important is that. So what, what are some good fats? Good fat like eggs, good fat like 
be bacon. There are some people don't always have it, but let's see if you can have good, good eggs with like scrambled eggs with some vegetables. That is a really good combination. Like spinach. Mm-hmm. Um, I love uh, celery. It has a lot of nutrients. I love spinach who has a lot of nutrients. So I make a, like a, a little juice in the morning, vegetable juice. That's enough. That's absolutely enough. I put a coconut oil spoon. I couldn't believe miracles of how that, what I heard about coconut oils because mm. it really is like an omega that we need in our brain. And the first thing when you're pregnant, the first thing the doctor give you is omega-3 for your baby brain. And we tend to forget about that. And our brain definitely need that healthy fats. So then for lunch, it can be the chicken, it can be the fish, but we definitely have to add more good protein and good fats. You know, one of the things that, because I have done some um, uh, over the last, I don't know, 10 years, some real significant changes to the way I eat, um, that, um, you know, I was at that time, I was I thought I was managing my ADHD pretty well. Um, and I read something about how uh, the ADHD brain tends to not do a great job at breaking down um, such like simple carbs and uh, breaks, it releases that, that tryptophan, you know, the, the ingredient in Turkey that they say makes you uh, really tired. Personally, I think it's probably all the mashed potatoes and other things that make you tired when during Thanksgiving dinner. Um, but so I'm like, you know what? Let me try. Let me see what happens if I just, you know, it's like it's it's not going to it's not like this radical, like, you know, lifestyle where it's like you're doing something that's risky. Like there's really no risk to seeing what happens if I have a protein shake in the morning versus, you know, a bowl of healthy cereal. Because that's what I for for a long time. I'd be eating like healthy cereal with cut up fruit and which is really like my brain just goes, all right, this is kind of like cake. Cause it's all carbs. Right. And so for, for years I would have a bowl of healthy cereal and like a pot of coffee and I'd fall asleep on the couch. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like I already taken my Adderall. I had a ton of ca- caffeine and it, what I found it was, it was the cereal. It was the hell, like, and it was like the hell, like the cereal that I would call bird food. Cause it literally like no sugar on the cereal, like just super, super healthy cereal. And it would put me to sleep. So I'm like, let me just, cause you know, my, my ADHD is more of the inattentive type. So like low energy and activation is always a struggle, especially in the morning. So I was like, man, if, if changing the way I eat could, uh, you know, give me more energy and not like, be so just like sluggish and tired in the morning, like I'm, I'm trying stuff. So I tried uh, this uh, to make this protein shake. And then for the next, I think, five years, that's all I had for breakfast for the protein shake because mm-hmm. um, it made a huge difference. And it was a pain in the butt to make a protein shake. But it was wor- like the outcome of it was worthwhile that it became worth the extra effort to make the protein totally. shake. Totally. Right? So it's like when it comes to changing things in your, your diet, I say, you know, it doesn't hurt to try. But I also think don't like don't think it's going to be this silver bullet miracle, right? Like try it, see what happens. It might be this amazing change for you. Consistency is the key. If you consistently persist, uh, there are two different types of ADHD who likes, I am the typical that one simple and easiest thing. Uh And for me, repetition is not a problem. If I have to eat the same thing over and over, I prefer because it's easier and I don't have to think Agree. twice. I totally. It's, and, and I talk to, to people in my groups about this because like, I have the same, like I basically, I have a rotation of basically two to three different things that I have for breakfast. Um, and it kind of, I have pretty much the same thing for lunch almost every day. And yep. people are like, well, isn't that boring? I'm like, yeah, but I you love know, it. well, and for me, it's like, yes, yeah, so it can be boring. However, I want to use my executive functions, which are limited for other more important things. And there is actually a, a real freedom to not having to decide what you're going to eat. I agree with you. So it's like, I know, and, and I've actually learned that my body, my body is sensitive to some foods. Um, I discovered that things that have corn and corn based like stuff in it, like my body just like, it does not like, um, I get very bad stomach aches, uh, from it. And so, uh, if you, you know, like every processed food that there is almost has some kind of corn ingredient. So it's, uh, it does really limit what I can eat. Um, yes. and corn also comes in a lot of disguises, like different names that aren't called corn. Um, so it's, when you realize it's in everything. Um, but it's, you know, it's again, one of those things where it's like, all right, where I had this, this, uh, suspicion that, it, that there was this corn sensitivity. I eliminated it from my diet. I started feeling better. And then I have that notion of maybe it's not corn. 
And then I'll like, you know, eat something with Corey in it. And then the next day I'm just like, oh God. You feel it, right? Right. And because of ADHD, I had to relearn that lesson at least 10 times. And I'll, I'll probably keep learning that lesson because I'll like, oh, but I really want that, you know, fill in the blank of like really delicious food that is like wonderful for like 10 minutes. And then, you know, it's like just waiting for the, waiting for it to go through my body and waiting for the stomach ache to come. And, um, it was just miserable. I'll be like sitting in the bathroom for like an hour sweating, like almost every day, like for a big portion of my life. I agree. I, I had the same thing, but it was with my underbelly. It was always, I went to the GYN because I thought that I had a urinary tract infection mm-hmm. or I had vaginal infection. And honestly, I thought that it was pretty much that. I went to the doctors. They did all kinds of scans. They were looking for a solution and they always said, it's nothing. You have nothing wrong. And I say, my belly hurts. It really hurt so badly. When I started to do elimination diet, trying to check what is hurting you and the sensitive foods, it is a die and day in life. And every single people that I hear when they change the type of food that they eat in, it is better, better uh, performance, better energy, better motivation, better focus. So why not to? I know it's hard. Well, one of the things that I always suggest to people to think is that food is not your friend. Food is not your emotions. Food is not, food is nutrition. That's it. And unfortunately, yes, that's it. Not if you repeat that all the time, then you stop that, uh, that, that sensation. You have to have food. This, like when we are sad, when we are happy with, we celebrate always with food. But it's, if we understand to separate that, no, I'm eating because I need to eat. That's it. Not because I'm feeling something. It really kind of like a stop and that's kind of like a cognitive behavior therapy. Separate one thing to the other. You have definitely two brains. You are definitely two people in your life. The good one and the bad one. Separate that. And the good one has to win. So how do you help people for, with uh, who are are um, overeating, especially when they're like in that sort of in that moment where they're like they are in a they're in a binge and yes. they are like they see themselves in the binge. They know they're binging and they want to stop. OK. One of the things that I do is definitely listen to your thoughts when you are eating that. And one of the main things that you always say is you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't eat it. So the same, the guilty and the the shame. Yeah. Those are the most difficult emotions that are the lowest emotions. So when you have that, it works exactly the same thing that you are triple eating because it, your hormones, the cortisol, it really gets worse. So that's why you get overweight. So one of the things is just to listen to the way you're thinking And give a permission if you can give a permission to eat if you really think you cannot stop, which is absolutely not true, is that what we believe is different. I have chocolate brownie in my house and I don't need to have it because I changed the way. So one of the things is change the way you're thinking, tell it clearly, I can change. I I I don't like it. I hate you. One of and another one is how important, for example, for me, my brain is the most important right now. So w- I was imagining like a little monster anytime I was, and I always say to my clients and they're like, ah, I don't want to think about that, but it works. Think like a monster coming into your head and just grabbing, grabbing, grabbing a little bit of neurons in you and getting more stupid and grabbing and getting more forgetful and getting more like the more worst moment ever. When you realize that you, all of a sudden you don't have the neurons and they're all disappearing because you're eating all of that, you feel so panicking that you kind of like a one, two, like eliminate that. And so the brain works with two ways. One, the motivation. So motivate yourself with something else, reward yourself with something else, because there have been studies that show that the more you um, talk about something negative, your brain is going to eliminate it. That's the reason why people who smoke, people who overeat don't stop doing it. Because that doesn't work. You don't right. really need to keep all of that. You need to so replace it. You need to add, sort of add replace something. Replace yes. it with something else. Yes. yes. So for me, is I just imagine myself being super healthy, super happy, super because ha- mood is absolutely crucial. The neurotransmitter, the serotonin. If you have an overstimulation, that definitely impair the way of how you react. So if you have enough serotonin. That's fine. That means your le- serotonin level is low. Mm-hmm. So eat a little bit of almonds. Eat all food that increase your serotonin level and your dopamine levels if you are binging at the moment. So you know awareness is absolutely fundamental. 
yes, I know I am a bad person. I have in the food in front of me and I'm still eating. I don't care. I know what you're telling me, but I don't care. I'm still going to eat it. When you do the awareness, you do the stuff for a second and say, these are the consequences, but the benefits are better. Then it's going to be a good factor for you. And it really works. The more you repeat it, it, it is really, uh, it, I always see like a, the picture when the, 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 the more they fire, they stay together. Mm-hmm. So I feel the same thing. The more you eat it, they're going to stay together. Yes. So the monster is grow and the less you do it, it's going to disappear. And it's absolutely true. It is true. Because, you know, one of the things that, that I've been hearing from more and more people that are doing this like sugar detox and everyone who I hear do like that has done this, they say like it was miserable for the first couple of days. And they've never felt better. And, it's the um, best. and it's like, it's in, so my story is, man, I can't even imagine because, because of having a, a sensitive digestive system, like I sort of, I know the things that I can eat and I know lots of things that I can't eat. And so I'm like, I don't even know how I would do that. Cause a lot of the foods that I eat do, you know, do have sugars in them. Um, so I mean, it's, it's, I like I would love to be able to get just like three or four days out of the you know not eating sugar, but like everything I currently eat <laughs> I think has some sugar in it. Like I you know, my favorite moment in the morning is that first sip of coffee. But my first sip of coffee with it's I use one tablespoon and I don't go over a tablespoon of like a vanilla creamer. Um and it's just like it's like this moment of heaven. And <laughs> I wish that I loved that I liked black coffee and I've even tried I'm like let me just keep gradually like making that that tablespoon like small little smaller little smaller and seeing if I I can just sort of get used to it but then it gets like to a certain point where just it tastes too bitter to me and I just it doesn't taste good um and maybe it's just because I'm so used to sugar that like because I've heard people say like once they sort of have eliminated sugar like they can't really eat really sweet things anymore uh, let me just put it this way. Yeah. There are different par- there are different sensitive brains and they are really actually a test that you can see how sensitive you are. There are people who are uh, one to five, which you can have certain foods and they're not as addicted. Okay. Their food from like from six to seven or eight, it is medium. So that's mean a little bit of be careful with what you eat. Uh, there, of course, if you look into every single uh, level, it does have sugar, but it's not like as if you have the ice cream or the cookie or certain typical food. But if you, uh, if you are between eight to 10, that's mean you're really high, high, high sensitive. And I was maybe 20 <laughs> from 10. <laughs> so I knew, I knew that I had an addiction. It was absolutely an addiction with sugar. So uh, that, that definitely the fact that I'm just thinking if I eat it again, I'm going to become again and the, that as addicted as I was, mm-hmm. that gave me the panic and doesn't like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do it again. But there, as I say, you don't have to be so extreme. One of the things that I always recommend is just to think it's just for today. It's just for today. Mm. It's just for today. And tomorrow is another day, but like just that. for today. Yeah, it's, it's the same stuff that I tell my, my clients too. It's like they want to, they set these goals that are like huge. And I'm like, okay, that's great. So you want to write this book. Okay, today, maybe focus on turning on your computer. Yeah. Right? Like really small because it's big small. goals are accomplished by lots of small steps repeated at a fairly consistent level. Over and over and over and over. Yes. And the more you look at the goals on the highest, let's see, if you cut the sugar, that's it. You're never going to do that. But if every day, just for today, I do less than I did yesterday and the day before is going to work that better. There are people who are extreme and I ne- there's people who are extreme. The first thing I'll tell you, that's it. You, you have the option to keep suffering all your life. I suffer so much. I don't want to keep suffering. Now, one of the interesting things for, for me, so when I was diagnosed with ADHD, uh, I was 19 and I was, uh, I was, was, I'm six foot one. Um, and when at that time I, I think I weighed about 250 pounds. Um, I was pretty, I was pretty solid. I, I I lifted weights and, um, but I had a belly. Um, I was probably, I think like my, um, I I think I still have like one pair in my closet just to remind me um i was like a 40 waist which is pretty big um <laughs> and within the first year without even trying to do anything differently of being on a stimulant medication um i dropped about 25 pounds and it made me realize how often i was eating 
a completely it was like the opposite of mindfully like it was like i didn't I, I was not even hungry i was eating i was using food to procrastinate i would be telling myself i have to eat this food this thing before i can start my paper um you know but now i need this other thing because it kind of goes with this other thing it's like i can't just have the cookie i want the cookie and the big glass of chocolate milk uh because that just goes really well together right and when I started taking the medication, I would like sort of catch myself eating. And I'm like, I don't even want this. Why? And so it was almost the habit still was there of yes. doing it. And it, and it really became easy uh, to, to just eat when I was hungry. So um, and it's interesting because people um, and, and uh, Dr. Uh, Roberto Lavardi was talking about this uh, with him the other day that people with ADHD that, that especially who have um, binge eating um, uh, tendencies, and the stimulant medication could be so helpful just to, to not as even as apathy suppressant, just to help them like pause to realize that they don't actually want to eat. Um, and so when he's talked about that is that he's seen that with all his, his, his clients and that um, that's what the research shows. I was, I was like, yeah, that was totally my experience too. Um, with the medication, it just, it just helps you do the thing and be more aware of what you're doing. Um, cause I know <laughs> I still do this sometimes where I'm in the kitchen, I'm have a snack in hand, looking in the pantry for what I want to have for a snack. Yes. And it's like, I'm seeing myself do this and I'm like, I'm so glad there's like, we don't have like really junky food in the house because this would be a big problem if I did. One of the things that you mentioned the most, and it's been studies for eating disorders with or without HDSD, and now more for HDSD is meditation and mindfulness. Mindfulness is really the key. Yes. The more you are aware, and unfortunately, we have the tendency to think that meditation or mindfulness meaning sitting for 20 hours. No, it's just right now I can do meditate mindfulness right now, just feeling my body and understanding that I'm breathing. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of, I never thought about that. I never used awareness in my entire life, but it's absolutely the key just to know, okay, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And the why is absolutely fundamental. So uh, what else is fundamental is that we take one more break before we uh, uh, wrap up this episode. So we're going to take one more break and we will be back um, as we continue to uh, discuss some strategies. And maybe we can talk a little bit about the, uh, the joys of meal planning when you have sure. ADHD. So we will be right back. This podcast is brought to you by all of our patrons over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. I want to thank two of our new patrons who are both contributing $25 a month, Joanna M. and Erica I. You both can join me for our monthly coaching call. If you are listening to this on the day this podcast came out, the call is at 4 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much for becoming a patron. If you are new to this podcast, keep listening. And if you find that you are benefiting from what you are hearing, consider becoming a patron. If you can, consider becoming a patron at the $25 a month level. And this is a great way that you can join me and a small group of other patrons for an hour of coaching. Consider giving at ADHDrewire.com slash Patreon. I really do appreciate everyone's support. If you're able to support this podcast, I sincerely thank you. For those who do give at the $25 a month level, and for those of you who are looking for some coaching, a great way to get into this is to join us on our next group coaching call on Tuesday, June 23rd, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Consider giving at a $25 a month level and join us. Our group coaching calls are every fourth Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. If you can't support the podcast financially, consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Any amount that you can contribute is appreciated. Podcasts are free, but it is not free to produce. So thank you for your support. To become a patron, go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. Hey, do you ever struggle with the I don't want us? Well, this week, check out Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb, which you can get every Monday. This week, Will is talking about fighting resistance. Go check out what this week's episode is all about. Join Will as he explores ways that you can work with your ADHD brain to do more of the things that you want to do. These podcasts are much shorter than ADHD Rewired, so you may enjoy that if you're looking for something that you can digest in about 15 minutes. 
go subscribe. The same place you're listening to this at is Hacking Your ADHD. You can go to HackingYourADHD.com for show notes and to subscribe. And every Friday, check out ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan. At ADHD Essentials, they help families develop the skills and knowledge needed to better manage ADHD. Go to ADHDessentials.com to learn more. And on Brendan's latest podcast, he gives you ideas for a mostly at home summer with kids. I will definitely be listening to that. Check out the podcast, ADHDessentials.com slash podcast. Both Hacking Your ADHD and ADHD Essentials are both part of the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network, available to everyone, everywhere you consume podcasts. And you can join me and the host of Hacking Your ADHD and the host of ADHD Essentials for an hour of live Q&A. Our next one is on July 14th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Go to ADHDrewired.com to register for this and upcoming live Q&As. Join us every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern for an hour of live Q&A. Register for free at ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. Our next live Q&A is July 14th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Put it in your calendar and go register. We'll see you there. All right, we are back with Luz Jeremillo. And um, let's talk about, we, we know it's it's really easy to grab junkie snack food and it takes planning and, and foresight to have healthy food uh, to eat. What are some things that, that um, you suggest for, for the clients that you work with and for yourself to make it easier on the executive functions uh, to have, you know, good, healthy food uh, ready and available um, for you? Okay. But as I say, it doesn't matter if it's breakfast or your first meal, always includes the macros. Biology is something that is in our body. We cannot fight against it. So definitely always have some good, good, good fats like coconut oil or butter or something that is really give you a little energy. Uh, avocado is absolutely amazing. The green, green vegetables and eggs, if it's possible, but definitely that included protein. So for your serotonin and for your dopamine, which is our main friend that is missing. And then after that, you have your first, just check yourself from the first meal how long it takes you to have your next one. If you realize that two hours, three hours is enough, then you can have either, if it's in between the meals, like breakfast and lunch or breakfast and a snack, then grab an almonds. Almonds are really, really good for your uh, protein. It has a lot of good fats. Um, let's see what else. Uh, but let's, let's, sort of, let's sort of laser in there for a second. Cause you yes. think about, all right, so grab, grabbing almonds. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep a can of almonds, you know, in my office. Uh-huh. And, and then I realized that I just ate half a can of almonds. All right. So try to grab 12 and keep it in front of you, the 12 and keep the other one inside. So Don't keep it in front of you. Okay. Because. So cause I guess one, one of the things that, that I would, um, uh, I more consider is, you, you want to sort of um, uh, minimize how many executive functions are going to be used in the moment where you need to perform something. So yes. t- take the sort of the planning and preparation in a separate stage from having to, to use self-regulation. So let's say you, you want 12, 12 almonds is your, your, uh, your portion size. And that's what you want to have. It's supposed to be the normal. <laughs> right. So, so <laughs> don't open the can and take 12 almonds out when you want to eat the 12 almonds, open the can when you get the can make some baggies that each have 12 almonds. And, and so it's your pre preparing. So when you want the snack, it's a lot harder to keep eating, keep eating. Right. Yes. So it's, um, you know, uh, I think like batching, uh, is a really, I think a helpful way to, uh, do some pre preparation to make it easier in that moment. Um, cause often, especially when you have ADHD, like hunger pangs are the cue to eat. And then you just want something easy. And then like while you're preparing the food, you're also eating. And so I think so much of this can be helped by one of recognizing first, like, okay, do I want to eat healthier? If so, 
what can I do now? So the rest of the day, or what can I do at the beginning of the week? So the rest of the week, grabbing those healthy foods can be easier, right? Yes. So uh, are there, um, have you found any kind of like services or, or different resources that can be helpful for people to sort of set up that almost a systemized or even um, automated process for eating in a way that's healthy and really easy? Yes, definitely. Uh, write it down every single food that you have, even though it is um, every five minutes, every 20 minutes, 20 cookies, one cookie, write it down. Visualization help you more with what exactly you're doing. And you realize that, wow, it can be a good like to stop your action when you are more aware of what exactly you do. And writing it down is really a key. So planning what you're eating, some people are better than others. But for example, uh, frozen food, Keep it in the refrigerator and then every day you have already your food prepared. That is really, really helpful. Like for all you and me is to keep every day the same food that is less complicated. Mm -hmm. And or if you want to change, write it down on Sundays from Monday through Friday. What are you going to eat and keep it already in your house? So you don't have the temptation to start going and buying more stuff. That's one of the typical that it has helped me and it has helped many, many, many people with eating disorders and that we do have the impulsivity or just grab food for automatically without thinking. Um, so make a list, try to think about the food that are more for your brain health, like, uh, black, uh, raspberry, blueberry, raspberry. Those are sweets food. So if you feel the need of have some sweets, like a frozen blueberry is a delicious and it tastes like a nice cream. Mm-hmm. And like my kids used to have always chocolate ice cream. Now they have that and it really tastes good. Or cocoa powder, uh, it has micronutrients, it has antioxidants and it helps you as well with the needed of sugar or the eating of sugar all constantly. So it's, it's, it's just, there's so many ways. The problem yeah. is that it's not what we want, it's what we need. And we really, if we are so willing to do so. Because it is top with that, that I have ADHD and I cannot do it. I'm, I have impulsivity. That's really, I'm sorry, but it's up to how you desire, how much you really want to change. I mean, it's, it's all about having a growth mindset. It's like, yes, I have ADHD <laughs> and right. Like it may be harder, but it doesn't mean that it's impossible. It right? is absolutely right. Right. Yeah. And so it's about this, this just recognition is why, you know, in my coaching groups, I say all the time, it's like, we can do hard things. Like, yes, it's harder to, to plan and prep healthy food. Like, but we can do it. Like it's harder to, uh, to not impulsively, you know, just grab the, the, the donut or, you know, but we can do it. Like there are things that we can do when it, it's important to us. And also I think the other thing, and this is true, whether it's with, with eating or with any sort of behavioral change strategy, especially when you have ADHD is know that you're going to slip and that's okay. When you do just get back up. Like that's, you know, I think one of the things that happens so often is this, uh, it's just the result of, you know, people experiencing years of, of failure and then ex- the, the shame sort of compounds itself is that, you know, part of ADHD is we are inconsistent, right? It's, just, it's part of the nature of, of this disorder. What we don't need to do is when we realize we've slipped is to beat ourselves up while we're down. Exactly. Right? We, can, we can just actually skip that part and say, oh, I slipped. All right, tomorrow I'm starting again. Right. And it's I mean, it sounds like an oversimplification, but in some ways it really is like a determination to say, OK, I slipped. Let me start again. Right. Because um, that's what we have control over. You know, we, it's and people say you only have control over like your part of any relationship, whether it's the relationship you have with food or somebody else. And I think with ADHD, it's like you have mostly control over yourself because sometimes it's the impulsivity. Um, it's, it's sometimes it's like we were watching ourselves do things and we're like, I don't even know why I did that. Um, and the reason we don't know why I did that because you weren't thinking. Right. And so it's yeah. like when you have, like, so if there's impulsivity, you know, make it so you don't have to make those decisions all the time to be, you know, to like, as you said, you, um, and I was telling you before too, junk food in the house. If I'm impulsive, not a good idea to have it in the house. Um, here's exactly what your Halloween candy. I have a, um, a, a this thing that I got on Amazon. Uh, it's called the kitchen safe timer. It's like a, like a big, like pasta jar with the lid, except this lid, you can actually, you can set a timer, like lock 
on it and you can lock it for anywhere from one minute to 10 days. So during Halloween, when we get just this crazy amount of candy, uh, what we do is we've, um, uh, we, we keep it for seven days. Um, and after, so my son can have three pieces of candy each day. After we take the three pieces out, we put the lock back on for 24 hours. So it's like, it's not even like, it's not even an issue of willpower. It's like, it's just not available. Like we can't get it. Right. Can I say something about willpower that yeah. we always believe and people always talk about willpower? Sure. Willpower starts from the morning. You have a good willpower. Mm-hmm. And the more you do certain things during the day, it demeans. So if you are not having enough energy, it goes down. If you are not eating the right food, it goes down. If you don't know do an exercise, it goes down. So you are, it's not that you don't want to try Willpower doesn't work. It's something that you need a little bit more energy. It's like a battery that you charge your phone. You need to recharge it in order to, to go up, right? And it's exactly the same thing with willpower. There's so many things that goes down, goes down, goes down. So uh, that's it mostly uh, people at nine is when they eat the cookies right. and overeat at nine because the willpower is absolutely low. It's gone. So the more aware we are, okay, my battery is going down. My battery is going down. Let me charge it right now. So how do you charge it with the right food? Even though you have a bad day with the wrong food, at least add nutrients, at least add something that will help you. You're going to feel less guilty and it's still you have bad food, but, but help out with nutrients is absolutely fundamental. Every day, no matter what, even though you have a bad food, include the good foods. So then it, that it will help you less, less, less than the every day is going to be less the need of that. And change your mindset. We always want to be a victim. We always want to be, oh, poor me, poor me. If I always think if you did it, if somebody else who had ADHD are successful, I'm going to be like that too. I'm going to change that mindset for, for the good one, not for the bad one. I don't want to be like them. I want to be a good example for others. So I'm going to try myself. That, you know, there's a lot to be said for, you know, the belief that something is possible, you know, make that decision that you want to change and then figure out the next steps and you don't have to do it alone. Uh, there's all kinds of resources, um, and support, uh, out there. Um, if, uh, if, Liz, if people wanted to, uh, contact you and learn more about kind of what you do and how you support people, uh, where can they, uh, where can they find you? Yes. My company name is Brain Body Coach and everywhere like facebook instagram and website is brainbodycoach.com all right uh luz jeremela thank you so much for uh for giving us this food for thought thank um, you Ari. <laughs> and i know that was bad i can just like hear all the groaning um <laughs> but thank you for your time and uh and keep doing the good work that you're doing thank you you too all right thank you thank you for having me This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. 
and be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. If you have trouble asking for help, listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I will be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.